we should um, go ahead our schedule and um, actually present our new uh, our two um, um, speakers now. Um, Dr. Wen uh, is an assistant professor uh, the Department of Psychiatric and Behavioral Science at Emory University. Um, he will be talking to us about the brain organoids and how they could help understand uh, and treat green kids. And then we'll follow with uh, Dr. Amy Ramsey. I think everybody knows her by now, but uh, she's from the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology at the University of Toronto. And she will be talking about the mouse model and the use um, and its use for studying green disorders. Um, so I'll leave it to you guys. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the talks. Hello everyone, uh, thanks for organize, organizing this uh, meeting and inviting me to give a presentation here today. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah. So um, uh, the research of my uh, laboratory mainly focus on um, understanding the uh, disease mechanism, uh, the, the mechanism underlying the uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, in particular, the uh, intellectual and developmental disability. And we know that um, the, uh, um, we call the IDD, uh, such as uh, autism, ADHD, and intellectual disability affect millions of kids worldwide. And, um, it affect about 10% of children born in the United States each year. And we can see that the number keep increasing uh, uh, in recent years. Uh, for example, uh, for the autism, uh, one in 68 kids has been diagnosed as autism. And there's 30% increase from 2008 to uh, 2010. And the uh, the, the challenging is that uh, effort to uh, develop a therapeutic has been challenging and few, uh, very few novel treatments has been developed in the past decade. And um, uh, to develop uh, new treatments, we need to have a better understanding of the disease mechanisms. Uh, but how we can do that? So uh, this, uh, these are three uh, major clinical uh, preclinical models that are uh, widely uh, used in the in the laboratories, including the most potent brain, the brain imaging, and animal models. All of them has already provide very useful information uh, for our understanding of the disease. But at the same time, they also have some limitations. For example, the postmortem brain they present the, the end point of the disease and uh, cannot tell us how the disease initiate and how the disease progress. And the brain imaging also provide very useful information at the system level, but they provide limited in, uh, information at the cellular uh, and the molecular levels. And animal models are widely used in the laboratory, and they uh, also have already provided us many insights into the disease uh, biology. Uh, but we realized that uh, there are fundamental developmental, biochemical, and physiological difference between animals and humans. And so far, um, it, uh, uh, for, for, for many cases, and, or maybe for most cases, it has been failed to translate the basic finding into the human therapeutics. So we are wondering whether we could have a human-specific model that we can um, use the model to monitor the disease initiation and the disease progression um, uh, uh, that uh, 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 for, the, for, the, for the neurodevelopmental disorders. So one approach uh, is the uh, human-induced proposed stem cell or called IPA cells. Uh, this technology was first developed uh, by the uh, Nobel laureate, uh, Dr. Yamanaka in 2006 uh, in mouse and 2007 in human. Basically, by uh, introducing four transcription factors, now we call them as the Yamanaka factors, into the human somatic cells, like the skin fibroblast. And this will reprogram this fibroblast into the human embryonic stem cell-like cells. And we call this cells the uh, induced proponent stem cell or IPA cells. 
and uh, uh, basically uh, right now we could uh, collect the uh, uh, um, samples from the patients. Uh, for example, the skin fibroblast, the blood samples, or the urine samples. And then by introducing the Yamanaka factors, we could reprogram this uh, 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 somatic cells into the IPA cells. At the same time, if we know the genetic mutation in these cells, we could uh, do the gene, uh, uh, gene editing by the crispr cas 9 to correct the mutation. Uh, or at the same time, we can also introduce the same mutation to a healthy control background. And this cell, this, this IPA cell is called the isogenic lines. And then you could differentiate these IPA cells into the potentially any cell time we want, for example, the neurons. And from this neurons, the, the, this patient neuron, we can see what's going on in these neurons and what's the phenotype. And, and by uh, identifying this phenotype, we can use, also use this phenotype as the readout to set up a high throughput screening assay to screen a uh, uh, novel compound that may, can, may be can used back to the patient for the treatments. So uh, compared to the other model system, the uh, human IPA cells have uh, several advantages. So first, uh, this patient-specific IPA cells carry the exactly same genetic information from the patients. So this is extremely useful to study the complex human disease, like the uh, most of the uh, neuropsychiatric disorders that are, uh, we believe that they are the uh, polygenic uh, disease. And also, uh, these IPA cells are multipotent, means that potentially they can give, uh, the, they, can, they could be differentiated to any cell time we want, especially uh, those cell times has the disease relevant, for example, neurons, or glial cells that we believe that have the relevance to the uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. And this IPA cells also are renewable, uh, so, uh, means that uh, we potentially have unlimited source for the disease study or for the drug screening, or in the future, maybe for the cell replacement therapy. And they can also easily uh, uh, be accessible. Uh, we can generate the uh, IPA cells from a uh, small pieces of the skin uh, biopsy and also a small amount of uh, whole blood samples or the urine samples. And there's no age limitation. We can generate IPA cells from, uh, from subjects that, from patients that are at any ages. And importantly, um, as I mentioned, that they are the patient specific, then uh, they could be. Uh, very useful for the future personalized medicine, for example, for the personalized drug screening. And also there's minimal uh, ethical issue and there's no immunal uh, 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 genetic issue that uh, so that the cells differentiate from the uh, uh, IPA cells could be used for the future um, cell uh, replacement therapy. But uh, compared to other model system, the IPA cells also has some limitations. Definitely, we can see that this is the in vitro model that we cannot do behavior tests uh, on this model. And also, um, the IPA cells, uh, uh, the, the cells dif differentiate from the IPA cells somehow still um, less mature than, than, the, than the cells in vivo. So, uh, and also, they are, um, uh, the, the neurons, for example, they also lack of melanation. Uh, so this is also the, one of the um, um, limit, limitations currently. So um, in the recent years, uh, many differentiation protocol has been established to differentiate this IPS into the uh, many cell time in, in the human brain. For example, from the IPS cells, we can differentiate to the uh, neuroprogenitor cells uh, brain uh, region specific uh, neuroprogenitor cells, and then we can differentiate them to different type of neurons in the brain. For example, the cortical automatic neurons, the hippocampal uh, uh, neurons, and the garbagic interneurons, as well as other type of neurons, for example, the dopaminergic neurons and the motor neurons. At the same time, we can also differentiate these uh, IPA cells into the glial cells, including the exercise and the microglia. Uh, for example, this one example of the uh, cortical neurons differentiate from the IPA cells we can see that uh, uh, they can form the synapse uh, uh, in the in vitro cutler. 
then they can also have the uh, spy structures uh, that are um, uh, similar to the in vivo case. And importantly, they also uh, uh, could uh, respond to the uh, uh, stimulation like the potassium chloride stimulation that indicated by the calcium imaging. And when we do the patch cam, patch cam recording, we can see that they can fire action potential and have the uh, spontaneous uh, synaptic uh, event, synaptic uh, uh, activity. However, this is the 2D differentiation. And uh, this 2D, different, uh, 2D culture state lack a brain uh, cyto architecture. They also lack 3D microenvironments. And, and, and this 2D uh, cultures, although sometimes we can do the co-culture with different cell time, but uh, they are missing many cell times uh, when compared to the human brain. And we know that the human brain is a 3D uh, structure. So um, we are wondering whether we can have a model that can uh, recapitulate the human brain structure. And in 2013, um, Lancaster, uh, Lancaster first developed the uh, 3D brain organoid from the uh, human IP cells uh, 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 using the uh, bioreactor, spinning bioreactor. And we can see that they, they have very similar structure that compared to the human cortex. Um, but at that time, this is the first generation of uh, human brain organoid. Uh, and we use the traditional um, uh, bioreactor. So the limitation is that the, this throughput is low and, um, and, and the cost is quite very expensive. And also this is um, uh, a generic uh, 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 brain organoid that have different uh, brain regions here. So when we use this uh, brain organoid for the experiments, uh, that, that there are lots of the uh, vibrate between uh, organoid to organoid. So uh, in 2016, when I was a postdoc um, at Johns Hopkins working with uh, Dr. Hong Jin Song and Guo Li Ming, uh, the student in our lab, uh, Xi Yu, uh, he developed a miniature bioreactor by the 3D printing. And here uh, is uh, what the brain organoid looks like in our incubator that we can see that uh, uh, with this uh, miniature bioreactor, we can use the traditional pure well play, and then we can grow the organoid uh, with uh, many conditions. Then we can test, uh, uh, um, we can compare uh, different treatment conditions at the same time. And we also um, uh, modify the protocol to generate the brain region specific organoids, for example, uh, uh, cortical organoids or the uh, midbrain organoids. And here uh, are the cortical organoids look like in the in the in the culture plate. And when we zoom in, we can see that uh, uh, this organoid have different layer structure that's similar to the human cortex, including the ventricular zone, some ventricular zone, and the cortical plate. And when you look at the development of this uh, brain, uh, human brain organoids, we can see that they also resemble the human uh, brain development. For example, at the early stage that the majority of the organoid are the SOX2 positive um, uh, 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 ventricular zone like layer. Uh, and later on, for example, at the day 56, we can see that the neuroprogenitors from the ventricular zone start to migrate out to form the uh, uh, cortical uh, prey and differentiate into the cortical neurons that are uh, CD2 positive. And even at the later stage, like the, at the day 84, we can see that in, in the cortical plate, they can also form different layers as, uh, as the human cortex. For example, the CTIP2 and the TR, TBR1 positive deep layer, as well as the uh, CEPI2 and the CAS1 uh, positive uh, uh, upper layers. And importantly, in this human brain organoid, we have the primate specific layer called the outside a uh, subventricular zone. Uh, and this is uh, does not exist in the um, uh, rodent models. And this layer also very important for the neurogenesis in the primate, for example, the human brain. And uh, we are wondering whether this um, uh, human brain organoids also uh, recapitulate the uh, human brain molecular signatures. To confirm that, we uh, did the RNA sequencing on the uh, uh, brain organoids and compare to the transcriptome uh, from the human brain. 
and we can see that uh, this uh, brain organoid uh, uh, may re re recapitulate the molecular signatures of the human brain. And when we look at the different uh, uh, stage of the human brain organoid, we can also see that this organoid resembles the human brain development. For example, the, at the early stage of uh, organoids, like day 26, it's like a fetal brain uh, uh, at the, in the, uh, the first trimester. And uh, around day 50, uh, the organoids look like the uh, fetal brain at the uh, uh, eight, eight week to 12 week after the uh, pregnancy. And the day 100 is about a, a fetal brain in the, uh, in the second trimester. So with this brain organoid, we could uh, use them for the disease modeling. And we can also uh, use them for the drug uh, development. And, and, and in the future, we can also use them for the personalized medicine, bio, uh, identify biomarkers, and also assess the environmental risk uh, factors and study the neural immune uh, in, in, in your, uh, interaction, as well as to study the neural onco uh, oncology. And here, I want to give you guys an example how we use this organoid to study the disease. So uh, by team up, teaming up with uh, um, a colleague at Emory, uh, Dr. Pang Jin, that we uh, generate the iPCRs from the uh, uh, kids with the uh, fragile X syndrome. And then uh, we make the organoid uh, from this iPCRs. And, and we identify that in the fragile X um, organoids, they, uh, they, they have the early differentiation phenotype that they, uh, uh, when we compare the organoid at the day 56, we can see that fragile X organoid is it they accelerate uh, cortical layer formation. And we can, we also observe that the, uh, uh, the fragile X organoid also have uh, increased number of the synapse uh, when compared to the control organoid, suggests that they also have the accessory synapse formation in this uh, fragile X organoid. And then we also do the um, uh, patch cram recording to look at the uh, neuronal functions in the fragile, also, uh, fragile X organoid. And we mainly focus on one time of the cortical neurons that is the CT2 positive cortical neurons. And we can see that in the fragile X neurons, they fire more action potential when compared to the control suggest that they exhibit, uh, they exhibit the hyper excitability. And we also uh, generate the, um, the iPS cells from the uh, green kids. And this is one example uh, that the, the organoid uh, differentiate from the uh, iPS cells uh, with the green one uh, G620R mutation. And we also observe that the, uh, the, the green organoid neurons uh, is it a decreased synaptic uh, activity when we uh, record the spontaneous uh, post uh, excited postsynaptic currents called the spontaneous uh, EPSC? And we can see that both of the frequency and amplitude uh, are decreased in the green organoids. And to gain uh, the molecular insight into the organoids, uh, we could do the uh, RNA sequencing and, 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 and do the transcriptome analysis. Here is the uh, data that we uh, the, uh, from the uh, fragile X organoids. And we can see that uh, loss of the FMRP leads to altered expression of genes that are uh, involved in neural development, including uh, regulation of neural differentiation, um, axon guidance, uh, chemical synapse transmission, uh, uh, and the uh, social behavior, a synapse organization, and, and many terms that involve in the uh, neural development, and for example, the neural migration. Uh, uh, so we can see that uh, from this RNA sequencing, maybe we can identify the uh, biological pathway uh, that um, underlying the pathogenesis of the disease, and those bio uh, biological pathway could be the potential therapeutic target for drug development. And to look at the uh, transcriptome altern uh, alternation at a single cell level, 
we also did the single cell RNA seq on the brain organoids. And, and here we can see that we identified uh, many cell types in the, in the brain organoids. And we can also identify uh, the gene, uh, alternate, gene expression alternation in each cell type. Um, for example, the, in the neurons or the, or the glias. And we can also compare to, uh, the case and the control. We can also identify whether there's um, uh, the mutation, the genetic mutation will affect the um, uh, specific cell time differentiation. And for example, uh, in this fragile uh, uh, organoid case, we can see that they, 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 they have less uh, neuroprogenitor cells, but they have more um, uh, uh, differentiated neurons suggest that they have the uh, early differentiation phenotype. And when we compare, when we look, look at some specific gene um, expression pattern in the fragile X organoid, for example, the DCX, one is the one of the immature neuron marker that we can see that uh, um, um, it's highly expressed in some population, but uh, they lost in some population on, on, in other cell time. Uh, in the in the organoids, and also there's another um, uh, marker for the neurons that in the in the uh, called the uh, tube uh, 3.1, and then we can see that in the fragile uh, fragile uh, X organoids that they are uh, decreased uh, significantly in specific cell time, and with this single cell RNA sequencing, we can also do the uh, uh, called the uh, pseudo time uh, analysis to look at their environmental strategy uh, from the original uh, cells. Uh, with this pseudo time analysis, we can see that the uh, this the uh, environmental pathway for the control organoid and this the uh, uh, strategy for the fragile organ uh, organoid. We can see that they have very different. Uh, developmental uh, pathway uh, for the for the for the case when compared to the control, and we are wondering uh, from this data we may be able to identify the pathway or the mechanisms uh, underlying this uh, uh, alternation of the developmental strategy at the molecular level. And the last question is that whether we could use this uh, IPSC models or, or, or the organoid models for drug development. So the idea is that uh, with the patient, there's two types of uh, screening we could, we could do with the um, IPS cells, uh, IPSC models. First one is called the micromedicine that uh, we use the patient-specific IPS cells then to differentiate them to the cell time that have the disease realm from, for example, the neurons. And then we use the patient their own uh, um, neurons for the drug screening, and this for the personalized medicine. And on the other hand, we also could use this IPS cells for the uh, called the uh, macro medicine. That basically we generate the IPS cells from a cohort of patients that they have some uh, um, homogeneity. Um, for example, the uh, green green patients. Uh, that uh, green kids that they have uh, some uh, they share some common phenotype. So the patient cohort usually used for this type of uh, screening need to have some homogeneity. Uh, for example, the genetic homo homogeneity. That uh, one example is the green that they have the rare highly penetrating mutations, and the other type of homogeneity is called the clinical homogeneity. That they either have the endophenotype or they have the pharmacological, a uh, similar pharmacological response. And with this screening for the, uh, uh, for, uh, from the uh, uh, cohort of, of iPS cells, then we may identify the new compound that can be used for um, uh, more patients that share some uh, similar phenotype. And here's one example, we use the iPSC model for the drug screening that uh, uh, this project is to screen compound that can uh, prevent the Zika uh, infection, or the we know that the Zika virus caused the microcephaly in the in the fetal brain. And at that time, we used iPS cells to identify that indeed the Zika virus 
uh, many target uh, uh, neuroprogenitors and the uh, exercise in the in the fetal brain. And we also found that the Zika virus caused the cell death uh, uh, of the uh, uh, neuroprogenitors and exercise. So we use this as the readout to establish the high high throughput uh, screening assay using the uh, cell vibrating uh, uh, as the readout or the uh, one of the uh, cell death indicator called the uh, uh, caspase 3 or 7 activity assay. So uh, with this assay, we have screening, we have screened about 6,000 compounds, including three major libraries, including the uh, local library and the uh, FDA approved drug library and the clinical candidate compound that are in the clinical trial. And from all these 6,000 uh, compounds, we identify 35 pot potential hits. And eventually, we identify three compounds that can either uh, inhibit the cell death or uh, prevent the uh, virus infection. Uh, so uh, this is a 2D uh, screening assay uh, using the IPC models. But we are wondering whether we could use the human brain organoids as the screening platform. To do that, we collaborate with uh, uh, Dr. Hang Lu at the Georgia Tech to establish a microfluidist platform uh, to uh, grow the organoid and, and, and to use this platform for the uh, screening of compounds. And this, this, this is how it, look, uh, it looks like uh, for the uh, microfluidic device. And right now we are uh, uh, scaling up this um, um, multi-well um, microfluidic device to the um, 96 cell format or the 384 uh, well format for the screening. And the, the, the good thing of the microfluidic device is that it could control precisely the catch conditions. And we could also do the in situ uh, imaging assay to monitor the uh, organoid development and, um, and, 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 the, and the phenotypes uh, between the case and the control. And uh, the device also are uh, automatable that uh, in the future that uh, we can do this uh, screening automatically with the robot system. And they can, they, they also are scalable that uh, as I mentioned, that right now we are scaling up it to the 96 well or 384 well uh, play uh, footprint. And we can use them for the multi compound screening. And we also uh, could test the candidate compounds with the brain organoid. Here is one example that we test some compound for the fragile X organoid. And we can see that we use the uh, uh, synaptic formation as the readout. As I mentioned that in the fragile X, uh, fragile X organoid, they have the accessory synapse formation. And when we uh, use two compounds here, one is the mgr 5 antagonist, and we don't see effects uh, of this uh, antagonist on the synapse formation, but uh, we, we use another compound, is the uh, PI3 kinase inhibitor. We can see that indeed it can um, uh, rescue the synapse formation phenotype in the fragile or fragile X organized uh, largely. So uh, this is what I uh, talk about today on how, why, and how we use the brain organoid to study the uh, neurodevelopmental disorders and to, uh, uh, and also to screen and test uh, poten uh, 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 potential therapeutic compound. But uh, at the end, I want to uh, say that uh, human iPSC is one of the models, but uh, we also need to uh, combine the data with the the results from other models, from, uh, for example, the clinical assessment, the human genetic data, the data from uh, brain imaging, data from the uh, postmortem brain, and the data from the uh, animal models. And, and by integrating all the data from different model systems, that we maybe have a better view of the, uh, we have a more complete view of the disease and have a better understanding of the, the the, the, the disease biology. And here I want to uh, thank all the people in my lab, especially uh, Ying and Yan Fei uh, and Jie and Weibo involved in the Fragile um, uh, project and the Green project. 
And I also want to thank all my uh, collaborators involved in the data I present today, um, especially Amy and Rob, uh, who helped me to initiate the green project. And definitely, I want to thank all the green family who donated the sample to us. And I also want to thank all the um, uh, funding support. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wen. Um, if you don't mind, we just go to the next uh, speaker and then we uh, do the little question and answer. So far, there's no questions. So please, if anybody has a question, this is the moment. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. So I give um, Amy. Um. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just getting my, um, just gonna get my presentation pulled up here. Okay. Oops. All righty, can everyone see this? Okay, Sandra, can you see this? I yes. hope so. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for inviting me and I hope that you're not getting bored of seeing me. I, I really appreciate that I um, have been able to share this with you and I'm, I'm here to try and answer questions that you may have. Um, and I thought that I would just talk more generally about how mice can be useful. And I think it's really nice to combine this with what we just heard from Jay Singh Wen. And I, I wanna say Jay Singh, that's beautiful work that you're doing and very exciting. Um, so I think the, the, what, I, what I feel as a researcher is that um, parents and families have a lot of questions that we should be able to answer for you. And this is what we want to do in our research and um, what we can try to approximate in mice. So many of you, you know, once you get the diagnosis, you want to know, is this a gain or loss of function? Because that could one day determine what kind of medicines or therapies that, um, that your child might get. And, and you know, can we expect things to get better or worse or stay the same over time? Um, this is a really important question for, for planning and, um, and, you know, and then more specific uh, answers about um, treatments like, uh, is there a certain diet or medicine that, that could benefit um, my child? Um, you know, this is the most important uh, question that I think you really want to know. Um, but, but there's also a lot of questions like, what, why is this happening? What's, what's actually going on, you know? And what's the root cause of, of these seemingly very different symptoms? And it's not satisfying just to know, oh, it's the NMDA receptor. We really want to know what's going on in the body. And, and um, you know, I think as, as Jenny Lynn Jenny Lee mentioned, um, this is not just, um, uh, you know, changes in the brain, but perhaps changes in the body as well that could be either due to changes in the brain or, or due to roles that NMD receptors play in the body. So these are some of the questions that I would like to answer um, and would like to be able to give you good, solid responses to those questions. So, um, there are a lot of reasons why we use mice in, in particular, and it, it might not make sense, um, you know, for someone who, who isn't a researcher, why you would use these animals, because on the surface, they don't have a lot in common with humans. And so they're, they're very practical reasons. Um, at the heart of it is that as researchers working with humans, or with working with animals, we have to find a model that um, is a good balance between approximating what's going on in the humans without, without working on animals that are sentient and that have um, 
you know, that are so close to humans that, that there's a lot of ethical concerns. So working with primates can be ethically very challenging. And so we, we try to look for the, what's called the lowest order species. So this is the um, kind of on the hierarchy of, of animals um, with kind of us placing humans at the very top. We look for that animal that's as far away from humans that can still model humans. So this is what mice represent. And there's, another, there's some other more practical reasons. They have very rapid reproductive um, life cycles. So mice are reproductively mature when they're four to six weeks old. And then they can have a new litter of mice every three weeks. Uh, and each litter of mice can have six to eight uh, mice or, or sometimes as many as 10. So you can very quickly um, generate animals that have basically the same genetic background and they're only different in the one gene, um, which is the gene that you're looking at. So this is really powerful and there's not another mammal um, that, you know, that is better than mice in that sense. And they're also small. So, so they, that means that they're, they don't cost a lot to, to feed them. You know, a, a larger animal it needs more food and they need more space. Um, so that's a practical consideration. So those two things have meant that mice have a huge advantage over, over other animals because we know so much now. We've used mice for so many years, since the 50s. We've been really, they've been our kind of workhorse animal. And so we're building on all of the knowledge that we have with, with every year of research that we do. And I just want to reassure you that in terms of GRIN, um, the gene is, is almost identical between mice and humans. So when we're looking at, um, for example, a point mutation that causes an amino acid change in a child, it's, we can make the exact same um, change in, in the mice and it's going to do the exact same thing in the NMDA receptor. So, um, you know, another, another consideration is that if we're ever going to find a therapy, one of the main um, model systems that's used for any therapy to be approved is a, a rodent, so either mice or rats, and then they do other testing in a non-rodent animal, like a, like a dog, honestly, is, is usually what's used as the secondary one to make sure that the drug isn't toxic before they would start doing anything in humans. So those are the reasons why we, we would use mice. Um, however, there are some problems. Um, and and Jay Singh, I think, captured that really nicely. They, they clearly have much simpler brains than humans. And they have very different behavior and physiology. What a, a mouse needs to do to survive is very different than what a human needs to do to survive. So, you know, they are nocturnal creatures. We are diurnal creatures. They only live for two years and, and we can live for 80 to 100 years. Um, you know, their metabolism is like 10 times faster than, than ours. They eat 10 times their body weight every day. So you can imagine that in all of this physiology, they are different. And so many times we will find drugs or therapies that work in mice. And then when we go move them to humans, they don't work. So I think that should be something that you keep in mind that even if something looks really promising in mice, it, it doesn't always translate uh, to humans. And in fact, there's, there's a lot of frustration around um, that making that transition from, from animals to humans. And, and also there's some aspects of human behavior that we just can't study in, in mice. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, some of your children have issues with reflux and um, vomiting. And that, that uh, gag reflex isn't um, present in mice. So medicines that would cause nausea or vomiting aren't always picked up in, in mice because they don't have that same uh, behavior and physiology. So, um, 
you know, other things like hallucinations. Um, we, we don't know what the mice can see or what they can't see. So there's just many behaviors we just simply can't study in mice. Okay, um, so the other question that I think you may have is, you know, do we need to have a mouse made for my child's variant? And it's, it's a, there's not an absolute answer, but I, I just want to give you some things to think about. Um, making a mouse is expensive. It, it's, it's really not so much about the technology involved in making that an original mouse. It's more um, the time that it takes, and it can take about a year, um, and all of that is someone's salary and, and um, all the cost of, of doing animal experiments. And then um, it's all of the money that is involved in maintaining those mice for the years and years that it will take to study it. So we don't have endless resources to, to make, you know, a hundred different flavors of mice. Um, and and I, I guess I want to reassure you that uh, even though your child is um, perhaps unique and perhaps the only one who has a given variant, we are able to classify them um, and into certain categories. And so what we really need to do is make sure that we have each category of a variant covered. We don't necessarily need to, to make a mouse for every single um, amino acid substitution or for a missense, um, I mean, for a, a nonsense mutation that would cause like a truncation mutation or for just a, a big deletion. So, so those are some of the categories, um, you know, deletion versus missense. So deletions, we, we already have those mice. And those are the, the knockout mice that were made, um, you know, 10, 20 years ago, before we even knew about Grin disorders. We were just studying NMDA receptors, and by we, I mean the scientific community. And so one of the ways that you study, you know, genes is to make a mouse that is lacking that gene. And, and so we have those that would correspond to the deletion variants that we see. And those are, uh, most of those are available for us to just order. So it's those really, we, d we don't necessarily need to be pushing for those. Um, the missense ones, that, that's the one where we, we want to have mice that would represent, for example, gain or loss of function. So that would be the big category. But then we could also think about looking at um, different aspects of, uh, where, you know, like what part of the NMDA receptor is changed? Is it changed because of where it's located? Is it changed because it's not, um, it's not being activated for, with the neurotransmitter that it's supposed to be activated with? And so I would estimate that probably for each of the GRIN genes, we, we probably don't need more than, you know, three or four mice and, and the knockouts, the deletion variants are, are really already out there. So we don't need to be making a lot more in order to get this, these, these categories covered. Because at the end of the day, what we want to do is find a therapy that's going to apply to as many kids as possible. We don't want to necessarily find a medicine that's only going to work for this one variant. And I think that it, it is possible for us to identify um, treatments that would be beneficial for lots of different um, types of variants that fall into these different categories. Okay, um, I, I wanted to kind of demonstrate how many mice we already have out there. So on, on in kind of the big letters, I have the ones that um, that our lab is, is working on. And some of these we've had in the lab for a long, long time and others we're just making now. So here's the status. This one we've, we've been working with for about 20 years and we know a lot about um, what this mouse looks like, how it behaves, 
medicines that make it better, medicines that make it worse. So we have a, a lot of information on these mice and, and they represent mice that just have low levels of a wild type um, NMDA receptor. So they don't have changes in the spelling of the NMDA receptor, the GRIN1 gene. They just have low levels of, of, of the protein and the mRNA that's made. But we've been starting to make some of the patient variants and you've probably heard me talk about this one. We've had this one in the lab for over a year now. This one we have had in the lab for a couple of months and we're just starting to do experiments on that one. And this one is being made right now and, and this one is still in the planning stages. So this is our, will be our first grin to be. But there's several other grin to bs that are um, in the process of being made or have been made by other, I'm sorry, these are already existing right now. Um, we have some GRIN 2Ds. We have some other GRIN 1s that other people have made. And, you know, I think right now um, what we need to do is fill in some of these GRIN 2As um, and, and think about maybe the GRIN 3s or the GRIN 2C. Um, so, so I think that we're getting a, a, a pretty good list of mice and the idea is that we'll we'll be able to you know share these and and um for example these two uh mice are being sent to emory and this one as well um for the trainellis and and um and hongji uh wands group so we we have um we have you know we'll be sharing these these mice with with anyone who who wants to use them so uh, I wanted to spend the rest of my time with you to talk about in more specifics how we're using these mice to help people with a disorder. And um, you know, I, I think the main advantage of mice is that we can look at their brain and, and in the live animal, and I mean, not the live animal, but um, we can either look at them while they're alive or we can dissect out their brain after they die and we can measure the levels of proteins and um and mrna the the instructions to make these proteins and and we can look and see how specific parts of the brain are changed um, so that gives us a lot of insight into what might be happening the other thing that we do, can do is we can use these behavioral tests and they're really strange, I think, to um, you know, to, to people who aren't who aren't mouse researchers. It doesn't make any sense. But let me just try and demystify this. Um, behavioral tests are kind of like the blood tests for how the brain is working. So if you if you have a problem with your liver, you would do a blood test and they would see what are the what are the levels of certain liver enzymes and that would be the way to indicate, oh, it looks like the liver is not working properly. Um, if you wanted to look at the heart, you would probably look at blood pressure and heart rate and you'd maybe do um, electrocardiogram or something like that. And then you would get some indications about what's going on with the heart. Well, for the brain, a lot of how we know what's going on with the brain is to put these animals through these behavioral tests. And, and so this one we use a lot where you just put the animal in a new place and you watch how it explores. And um, this can be used to understand specific circuits of the brain that are used in exploration of a new environment. And, and believe it or not, we know which circuits of the brain are involved in this. And, and you know, similarly, if we want to look at the circuits of the brain that are involved in, in social behavior, we would put them in a situation where they would have to choose, for example, between um, interacting with a mouse that they've never met before or interacting with just an, the empty metal cage that the mouse is sitting in. And, and we try to put numbers on these things. So instead of saying, hmm, it looks like this mouse is not as social as this other mouse, we would try and, and have a, a test where we could put a number on it and say, this mouse spent 23 seconds here and it spent, oops, and it spent say 50 seconds 
in the empty cage. And so we can, we can put a number on it. And then once you have a number, you can determine whether something makes an animal better or worse or closer to what a, a wild type mouse would, would look like. In this test, we're looking at how they deal in a stressful situation when they're out in the open. And, and so you're looking at how much time they spend out in the open versus how much time they spent in a safer, more enclosed environment. And the other one that I, I just wanna point out is this thing called pre-pulse inhibition of acoustic startle response. And this seems like probably the one that would be farthest away from a human behavior. But in fact, it's measuring something that is very similar in humans. So here you see this mouse that's in a little cylinder. And in that box, we will play a sound. And it will be a loud sound. And the, and the mouse will jump. And that startle response to a sound, um, we can measure exactly how high the, the mouse jumps. Humans do the same thing. We all know this. And, and so that's the acoustic startle response, and that can be measured. We can see how, how high does someone jump with a given acoustic sound. And we can also uh, measure a circuit uh, that is involved in dampening that response. And, and that circuit has to do with the arousal state of your brain, how alert you are, how, how much those circuits that are about um, watching out for danger, how much are those activated? And so if a mouse is in a highly alert state, then we, we don't, that, that mouse doesn't have the ability to attenuate its jump. And so it, it, it lacks that um, attenuation that can happen if you play a small sound just before you play the loud sound. And humans are the same way. And, and, and so if you play a soft sound right before the loud sound, then, you'll get less of a jump. And that has to do with your, your brain's ability to filter things out. And, and so we can use this really strange behavior to assess certain brain circuits. And so even though this doesn't make any sense about why we would do these things or how this would have anything to do with your child's behavior, ultimately what these are are just tests to try and get an idea of which aspects of the brain are not working properly because we have a lot of knowledge about how certain behaviors correspond to certain brain regions or certain circuits of uh, connections of brain regions together and and i want to finish up just by talking about some of how we've kind of put this all together so uh, we worked with the mice that just have low levels of NMDA receptors, and we did a lot of studies looking at their postmortem brain. So we would measure the levels of proteins, the, le the levels of, of mRNA, of, of transcript, gene transcripts. And the picture that we got from all of that detective work was they were showing signs of a bioenergetic deficit. So there were a lot of changes in mitochondrial genes. It looked like all of those mitochondrial genes were upregulated, like there was more mitochondria or they were working harder. And at the same time, we, we saw some other evidence that these mice were not absorbing glucose the way that they should. And so we started studying this aspect of how the mice are getting glucose into their brain. And glucose is the, is the way that neurons like to get their energy. And the way that they do that is the glucose is floating here in the bloodstream. And glucose doesn't normally get into the brain. It needs to be actively moved into the brain. And it gets moved in first through these cells called astrocytes, and then the astrocytes feed the neurons. So the astrocytes are really important for giving that neuron the energy that it needs. And, and what we found out was that NMDA receptors are, in, are actually important in that process. And we're not the only ones. I mean, I'm, what I'm saying is that we found out by reading papers of other researchers who have demonstrated that NMDA receptors are important in this or, or can play a role in this. And so this movement of sugar, of glucose, through the astrocytes and into the neurons finally requires these things called glucose transporters. And NMDA receptors 
can regulate how well those glucose transporters are working. So we thought, oh dear, if this is not working properly because there are fewer NMDA receptors and these glucose transporters are not working, maybe we could um, provide an alternate energy source besides glucose that, that doesn't need to be transported in. And so we, we decided to try ketone esters because when your body runs out of glucose, like when you're fasting, you haven't eaten for a long, long time, your body will start converting fat into ketones. And these ketones can be used by the brain as a different energy source. So this is, the, this is the ketogenic diet in the sense that when you take away all your sugar and your carbohydrates, then your body will, will use a different energy source, which is the ketones. And the ketones are fat, so they don't need to be actively moved through. They just can pass in um, to the neurons without any problem. And so we fed the animals a ketone ester. And we looked to see whether this would help with any of their behaviors and also what might be going on in the brain. So, so first, some of the behaviors. We put them in this open field here and let them wander around. And what you can see is that here we have what a wild type mouse looks like. And, and then if we feed the mouse the ketone ester, it really doesn't change their behavior at all. On the other hand, when we give the grin knockdown mice, um, it, when we, we put the grin knockdown mice in this environment, you can see that they're really hyperactive. This novelty kicks off their dopamine system and dopamine facilitates movement. So they've got a lot of dopamine um, that's being released right now and they run around quite a bit. And then um, what you also see is that over time there's some what we call habituation but it's not nearly to the level that it should be. So they're not really habituating over time as much as they should. And what we saw was a, a, what I would say is a modest improvement in, in this hyperactivity. So it was definitely lower, but this is not, um, we've, we've certainly seen medicines that can work better. However, I just want to show you this as this is kind of the, this is the treatment that we're working on right now. This is the newest data that, that I have. Um, the other test that we did was this PPI of acoustic startle response, so that pre-pulse inhibition. And what you can see is that when you give pre-pulses of different intensities, you can get more and more inhibition of the startle. So um, the, these are wild types, and these are wild types treated with the, with the beta-hydroxybutyrate. And you can see that at this loudest pre-pulse, their startle response is reduced to about 60% of what it would be otherwise. And so here we see that the knockdown mice, oh, do I need to stop? Okay. Uh, Sandra, please let me know if I'm going over and I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> okay. No, no, um, keep going, Amy, you're fine. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Christian. <laughs> Um, okay, so what I wanted to show you is just that this is impaired in the knockdown mice, especially at these quieter decibels, and that it gets a little bit better with the beta hydroxybutyrate. In fact, it, it looks, you know, almost like a wild type mouse. So maybe this is improving a little bit their behavior. This is not, you know, maybe the miracle cure, but this is also not toxic. And this really isn't even the ketogenic diet. So this is just giving um, this extra supplement, food supplement, um, onto their normal diet. But what we could do with these mice after we had run this battery of different behavioral tests, we can also then take their brains and study them. And, and so one of the things that we wanted to study was this idea of what's going on with the mitochondria. And so to do that, we take the living slice and we stain for mitochondrial activity. And this red glowing um, product is produced whenever the mitochondria are active. So the more red glow there is, the more active mitochondria. And I just want you to know, we're not looking at a single mitochondria here. This is actually a whole neuron here. So we're really zoomed way back 
and we're looking at a population of neurons here. And what we're measuring is how bright um, are, these, uh, are these neurons? How much fluorescence intensity is there? And so when we look at this, what we can see is there's a, there's a spectrum. So um, depending on the cell, there's more or less mitochondrial activity. And this doesn't really change that much with, um, with the BHB treatment in the wild types. But what you can see is that in the, um, in the knockdown mice, there, um, there is slightly higher levels of mitochondrial activity. But what the, the BHB seems to do is to allow some of this um, increased mitochondrial activity. So the, so the pattern is actually more spread out and it seems that there's, there's actually more energy production that's going on when you have this BHB um, as an energy source. And, and we, we did something called electron microscopy. To, and, and really the reason why we did it is we wanted to look at the mitochondria. We wanted to look at how many there were, um, but we looked in a region of the brain where there's a lot of myelin. And myelin is the coating that goes around axons, and, and that's really important for, um, for the electrical signal to travel across the, uh, across the brain in a rapid way. And what you should see with myelin, uh, with myelin are these um, concentric rings that are tightly compacted, and there's a lot of proteins that hold those rings together. And so the more compacted you would see, that, that would be a, a, an indication that the myelin has good integrity. And so what we were surprised to see was um, some of the fields showed this, this non-compacted myelin, where you can see it's, it's really ruffling. And um, we didn't see this everywhere in the brain, but in some of the um, sections, we did see this. And, and then when we gave the um, grin knockdown mice, the beta hydroxybutyrate, we saw less of this. So I'm not showing you the bar graphs, but I wanted to just give you some um, illustrations here um, to, to say that this aspect was improved and, and was surprising to us because we were actually doing this study to look at mitochondria. But when we did this, we, you know, we couldn't help but notice this other phenotype that, that we were not expecting to see. So, um, so now to kind of put this together about where we are and trying to understand, it, it really is a detective story. It's a process of trying to understand what's going on. And so what we think is that normally sugar works very well to feed neurons, but in the knockdown mice who have low levels of, of NMDA receptor, that sugar is not a good energy source for them because they're not able to utilize it. It doesn't get into the neurons the, it, the way that it needs to. And so if you can supply them a different energy source, like a, a fat that doesn't need to be actively moved in, then they have the energy that they, that they need to survive. But, but uh, in the absence of this, um, you can have some neuron damage. If the, if the neuron doesn't have enough energy, it could die that could lead to uh, an inflammatory response that happens whenever neurons are, are dying. And that inflammatory response actually leads to um, damage to the, to the myelin. And so maybe what we're doing is just preventing that, that inflammation. And so these are some of the things that we wanna do next. We do wanna look at how this would affect um, EEG patterns and seizure frequency. We're now doing the ketogenic diet and BHB on the new GRIN variant mice, um, both the gain and loss of function. And we're going to do some more studies in how mitochondrial function is changed and how um, neuroinflammation might be contributing to that myelin phenotype. And, and I'll just finish by thanking all of my many collaborators and um, especially I want to thank the parents and uh, Cure Grin for supporting our work and um, for giving us you know, the encouragement uh, that, that we need to keep going. So I'll, I'll stop there and stop sharing my screen. Okay. Thank you so much, Amy. Sure. That was beautiful.
Um, we have time for maybe a couple of questions for each one of you, uh, Dr. Wen and you, and then we move into the, the uh, roundtable discussion. We can do the rest of the questions. So um, I would start with Dr. Wen. Um, there was a question from one of the families. It says, um, you have created uh, organoids for green. Um, how much information do you have so far? So we have uh, generated um, many icon cell lines from green kits, and we are making uh, organoids from them right now. But uh, actually, unfortunately, due to the COVID-19, that uh, stopped our culture for a couple months. But we have uh, been wrapping up right now. So we are doing uh, many test uh, experiments right now. Actually, we are doing um, experiment uh, similar to what uh, Jenny Lee just mentioned, including the look at the uh, uh, development, neural development in the uh, green organoids. And we are looking at the uh, neuronal functions, including the synaptic transmission and the EI balance in the green organoids. And also, uh, we are looking at the mitochondrial functions and the uh, uh, reactive uh, oxidation. Uh, uh, and as I mentioned, we are also we are able to uh, generate a microglia. And actually, right now, we are also look at how the 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 the, the, the green variants affect the uh, uh, neural uh, microglia interaction and how this uh, uh, affect the neuronal functions. Yeah, but uh, this uh, is ongoing right now, but uh, I, uh, we don't have much limit data to, to present today. Yeah. Then another uh, quick, probably just goes down the line. Um, how um, do you have any compounds right now in your pipeline um, to test or screen with these uh, green organoids? Uh, yeah, we, um, we, we have um, several libraries in the lab, uh, the small molecules, including, as I mentioned, the local library and the FDA approved drug and the, and, the, uh, and the clinical trial compounds. Uh, but we also, Emory also have the chemical bio, uh, the, 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 the screening center that they also offer a different type of library. But our priority is on the uh, 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 synaptic mo moderate, uh, moderator and uh, uh, some uh, compound that are the mitochondrial moderator. And maybe we also will try some anti-inflammatory compounds. Uh, that's what uh, we, we, we are looking for here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and the next ones are for Amy. Um, uh, how would you categorize the mouse that are already made, are they uh, considered a missense mutation? Yes. Um, I think that ex almost exclusively the new mice that have been made are missense mutations. So they have a, a substitution um, for one amino acid to another amino acid, and they're based on, um, you know, patients. So we're, we're not making them um based on you know I, I, there are some that were made like 10 years ago where they were saying we think that this is where the glutamate binds and we're going to make this amino acid substitution to test that but now uh, the mice that are being made now are because there's a, a patient who has a specific variant um but the deletion um variants i i think that people are not working on building those because we have the knockout that would that would give the same phenotype and and i guess uh the other one that we could think about building is something that is a nonsense which means that it has a um instead of switching the amino acid it has the message to um to stop um and so you get a partial protein that's made um, and so we haven't really done those, but they, they might have been done in culture systems. And I think we could probably learn from the culture systems what is happening there. So by culture systems, I mean things like um, the work that, that Chavi Altafaj is doing or Steve Trainellis' lab is doing, um, where they, they put them into HEK cells or they put them into... Um, primary neurons and they can see what happens there. So yeah, I, 
I think we have lots of lots of functions and, and they honestly, in the mice, they look pretty similar. So, you know, I think this is another reason why um, it doesn't make too much sense to go crazy over making, you know, multiple variants um, is that from a, from a therapeutic point of view, we, we can, we can probably, we have enough. I think the one thing that we can't do is, is sometimes there have been um, situations where it's not really clear based on all of this cell data, whether it would be a gain of function or a loss of function. And I think ultimately we're only going to get that from the mouse or maybe from the brain organoids. And, but I kind of think, Jay Singh, I don't know, it seems like we're, it's taking about the same amount of time for us to, you know, it's a long process. Yeah. Um, and the last question for Amy, and then we move into the roundtable discussion. Uh, what is exploratory, non-exploratory be behavior uh, linked to in mice? Okay, so the brain regions that are involved in um, exploratory behavior. We know this from, um, we can do lesion studies where you cause a small damage in a very small brain region. Um, or we can also do it with um, studies where you apply a chemical just to a very small region. And now they're doing these studies where they activate with lights and there's special tools where you can activate specific pathways. So exploratory behavior is gonna involve the front of your cortex, which is your kind of planning and movement part of your brain. It's going to involve your hippocampus, which is involved in remembering where you've been and what you've already explored, what you've seen, what you haven't seen. And it's also going to involve your dopamine um, system because dopamine is needed for movement. And whenever you're in a new environment, your dopamine system um, increases, uh, your, your dopamine firing increases a little bit because your alertness level increases because this is new. You don't know, it could be a very good thing. It could be a very bad thing. And so just in general, your arousal level increases. Um, so that's what is happening during exploration. And then as you have explored something, if your all of those systems are working properly, you will conclude that there's nothing more to explore. This area has been explored and there's really nothing here. And a mouse will generally go to sleep because it's, we do this during the day, which is their sleep cycle. But if, you, if your arousal system can't calm down, or if you, know, you can't recognize that you've already explored this, then you would continue to explore. So that would be where we would see this loss of habituation.